Just a few announcements. First of all, welcome to those of you who have just joined us for this special evening at our Bible and Missionary Conference. We're delighted to have uh, Dr. Joshua Bogandjoko here with us to speak and uh, be a delight. I just want to re make a few reminders that what we have coming up tonight afterwards is a missions cafe, a chance for you to go and see different booths with each of the missions and missionaries that are with us or on our roster. Tomorrow there are parish gatherings. You can start arriving at your host's house around 6 and the program will start at 6.30. That's organized by Super Parish and you should have received an email uh, detailing uh, location and time. Sunday is a full day. Again, we have the privilege of, uh, of Dr. Bogunjoko speaking at all the services, but particularly at 515. I want to make sure that you are aware that we are having a special time of prayer to bookend our missions conference. This is not just an event as significant as it is, but it is spiritual work. And so we'd like to invite you to join us uh, with us in prayer that evening afternoon and then we will also have a time of fellowship over pizza and then move to a time of prayer for the um, for the uh, missions work and um, we'll have a video later on in this uh, from the Amaz Amazma uh, school but um, right now I'd like to turn it over to Kirk and lead us in some songs to prepare our hearts yeah. just stand and we'll, we'll sing together Shall we? 
My name is Zach Dalton and this is my wife Mackenzie and we are family mentors at the Amazima School. The Amazima School is a Christ-centered secondary school. It's a boarding school and so we live on campus with the students and Zach and I specifically live at a house of 24 girls. Um, our house is called the Hannah House, and we are directly in charge of 24 teenage girls ranging in age from 13 to 20 now. Um, it's our third year here, and we absolutely love it. Our role as family mentors is basically life-on-life -life discipleship. We are teamed up with our Ugandan partner, Jackie, and the three of us work together to help our 24 Hannah House girls grow in the likeness of Christ. Basically, any time the girls are out of school is when we're working. We start the weekday mornings with devotions on our front porch, and after school we help with homework, chores, 
We coach sports, we lead clubs, and Wednesday night youth group activities and small groups, you name it. We deal with a lot of discipline issues, many hard questions about life, and weekends are by far our busiest times. The Amazima School emphasizes academic excellence, servant leadership, and nurturing relationships, so we try to help our girls grow in all of those areas. We have been blessed to see amazing transformation in our girls in the two years we've been here so far, and we can't wait to see them graduate from the Amazima School and change the world around them for the glory of God and for the good of others. There's a goal of $55,000 that will be distributed amongst these key initiatives as we rethink our mission strategy towards partnership and empowerment on the continent of Africa. You see there on the slide Muslim evangelism. We see the next generation leadership, the Banda Health Initiative, church planting. And so we do want to be a part of this and ask that as you prayerfully consider to be generous, uh, towards the work of God in this continent. After the offerings collected, we'll have a short song, and then the children, kindergarten through fifth grade, will be dismissed for their program. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us in Christ, and the material blessings as well. Father, you say that you love a cheerful giver. Help us to give cheerfully so that others might know the love of Jesus that uh, they might be transformed and through them their countries and whole peoples would come to know Christ. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
children are dismissed at this time. Jesus loves little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, and Jesus loves the little children of the world. Sing, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Uh, God is very good in life to give us friends to go through life with, family, but friends in particular and friends to work with are in a special bonus, and therefore it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, a friend of not only Sherry and mine, um, but Joshua and Joanna Bogunjoko, doctors and Dr. Bogunjoko, uh, to be with us this weekend, but really a friend of Stephen Ann Lutz and Claire and Toru and uh, all the rest of us in SIM to come and speak to us. This morning, um, some of you uh, will remember and be friends with uh, Don and Jenny Townsend. And some years ago, uh, Joshua and Joanna were up at uh, Galmi, I think at the same time, the Townsends were up there. And uh, during that, shortly after that season, um, uh, Joshua and Joanna got tapped on the shoulder to come uh, leave uh, Galmi and to move up to uh, really the next to the top level of leadership in SIM. Don was not happy because he said, this is the best that this Christian hospital in this Muslim part of the Sahara Desert has ever functioned is with these two guys leading it. Uh, but they uh, were pulled up and for 10 years they served as our deputy directors for West Africa uh, and Europe. And then a few years ago they got asked to lead uh, all of us in the mission. So there's 4,000 of us roughly in different places in the mission and to lead. And it is a joy, and I think, although these guys are on the road all the time, there's many people who would just uh, call them friends just because of the way uh, they smile at us and treat us and lead us. And uh, Joshua, I've gotten to spend more time with, uh, epitomizes for me what it is that Sherry and I are so thankful for working in SIM, and that is this combination of a passion for making disciples in communities where Christ is least known, mixed with this outside the box, and in Joshua's case, this African outside the box approach to like, how can you do ministry? And um, I know some years ago when he were, they were still in the deputy role, I had a question and I, really, I thought there's only really one person I need help with answering this question. It was Joshua who was in Charlotte, so I drove to him. He won't remember my question or the fact that I came, but that was the guy that I needed to see to ask this question. Some few years later, um, we had formed Bonda Health and the fact that you can form a technology company inside of an evangelical mission is considered by most outside of the box. Um, and many people had troubles thinking it through. I saw Joshua and I was telling him about it. In less than 60 seconds, he said, we need that everywhere. Do it, what do you need to do? And so I held him to that. And a few years later, we formed a separate little company and I needed a board, uh, like the strongest board I could put together. And so I, uh, I begged, I couldn't pay him, but I begged Joshua to be on that board uh, with me uh, where he has been now on his second term. So it is, it is an honor to have a passionate man who's willing to think outside the box, who frankly thinks differently than I do, uh, much bigger, much broader, with a huge heart for Jesus. You will love hearing his story. Uh, Sherry and I came back because Joshua and Joanna were going to be here. So Joshua, you're very welcome. The leadership of this church, uh, Pastor Mike, and the leadership for inviting me and Joanna to be a part of this weekend and uh, to share in this time of really reflecting on the call of the Lord upon his church, the Great Commission. 
But I want to start by really thanking you as a church for your support, especially your support for many who serve with SIM and many who had served with SIM over the years. I know you've been a great partner to SIM and SIM missionaries for many, many years. Going back to, at least I know that this church supported the, uh, uh, the, uh, the international director three times mo removed from me. That's uh, Dr. He, Ian and Jun He, and uh, that's an amazing gift to SIM. And you have continued to, ser to support many, many others since then. And we're very grateful for your support to SIM, to SIM teams and SIM missionaries around the world, but also to many others, many of those who have spoken tonight because uh, the, the gospel is not the work of SIM alone, it's the work of the whole church. And all of those whom God has called, we are colleagues in the work of the Lord. Uh, so whether they go with uh, world mission to the world or they go with SIM or InterServe, we see one another as called together to the same purpose. So thank you for your part in all of that. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing a bit of my story, our story, Joanna and I, and Joanna is right here in, some, in front here, you meet her later. We will go to the SIM stand and we get to meet some of you. I've been asked to share my story tonight and then reflect a little bit on the church in Africa. I want to start by reading a passage of scripture, just one passage from the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. That's the, the story of Lazarus and Jesus' encounter with Lazarus. In verse 10 of that chapter of scripture, Jesus responded to what was going on around him as a result of his interaction with Lazarus. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The theme for this week has been, how will they hear? How will they hear? How will they hear that someone came to seek and to save them while they were lost? How did we hear? How did I hear? How did my family hear that someone came to seek and save us while we were lost. Let me say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this moment. And we just ask now that your Holy Spirit will speak into our hearts. This is a very simple story. It's the story of a life that you transformed because Jesus came to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. And Lord, graciously, you found my family and you found me. And I pray tonight that you will use this story to stir our hearts so that we can join you in this seeking and saving that which was lost. Because the question, Lord, for us is how will they hear that you came? Please speak to our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. My story, I've uh, called, I termed this uh, presentation my story because it's a story that started long ago, but it includes me. It's, a, it's God's story because although I'm one of the characters in this story, it is the story of God's redemption. It's also the story of obedience. It's the story of God's redemption, but it's also the story of obedience. SIM's obedience to God's call. Thank you. I think this is not working, so you have to help me switch when I raise my hand. 
great. So that good coordination. It's a, 125 years ago, actually exactly 125 years in December, December 4th, three young men arrived in Nigeria. They had come to reach the least reached. They had come out to Africa to reach the unreached. At that time, we were the unreached. We were the one that Jesus was seeking to save. We were the one without the good news of Jesus Christ. They had come out in obedience to the least reached. They had come out to those places that were forgotten. You see, the three young men wanted to go into the interior of Africa because at the time there were missionaries on the coast, but the interior was impenetrable for the gospel because the gospel required that human beings carry it into the interior. And they were responding to that very question, how will they hear? How will the people in the interior of Africa hear the good news of Jesus Christ? The three of them left North America, two from Canada and one from the US. They were very young men. The youngest was 21 and the oldest was 25. They wanted to take the gospel to those who would ordinarily not hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's see the next one. So you have the three of them in the picture there. They made it into Nigeria. And when they arrived in Lagos, they were told that their mission was impossible. Their mission was impossible. They were told that they could not reach the Sudan. So the interior of Africa, the grassland of Africa, stretching from Senegal in the west to Ethiopia in the east was what was called the Sudan at that time. And that's the region they were going out to reach. There were a population of about 60 to 90 million people who were living in that part without ever hearing the good news that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. These three young men were committed to the fact that these people also will hear this good news. So they stepped out to Africa to take that good news to our part of the world. They came in, they arrived in Nigeria, they arrived in Lagos, they encountered some missionaries in Lagos, and there was a famous saying that we have recorded that one of the missionaries on the coast, a senior Methodist missionary said to them, he said to the three of them, he said, young men, I tell you this, you are not going to see the Sudan. Your children will not see the Sudan. Perhaps your children's children may see the Sudan. You talk of a great encouragement for new missionaries. They had just been told they will never reach their destination. But they pressed on all the same. Within a year, the two oldest were dead. And that's the grave of one of them in Nigeria. The two of them were buried in Nigeria. They never made it back to North America. So if you are a 21-year-old, what do you do? Because Bingham, Roland Bingham was now 22, and he was the only one left. The older boys have died, and he was the only one left sick in Lagos. He came back to North America. Many times I've thought about that story. And I've wondered if I was the father of Roland Bingham, what would I say to him? I would probably have said to him, thank you very much. You've done your part. You pay your dues to God. Now look for a good job here in Canada and stay with me. Because, I mean, who wants to send a 22-year-old back to where his two older friends died? But Bingham never gave up. Because he knew that unless he pressed on, these people were still not here. 
So he recruited another team. They came down to Nigeria. They didn't succeed. He recruited the third team. They came down. One of those people died. His name is Taylor. He died by the river Niger. Then he recruited a fourth group. And was the fourth group that established the first SIM station in the very state that Joanna and I come from. And that was how the work started in Nigeria. It was said that in the first seven years of the history of SIM, there were more missionary graves than there were converts, which was true. Because the first convert was baptized in 1901. So from 1893 to 1901, before they baptized the first believer. But they never gave up because they knew that we have to hear the good news of Jesus. So SIM started the work in 18, about 1901 was when the, the station was finally built. In 1911, a young athlete, a champion athlete from Canada, arrived in the southwestern part of Nigeria, wanting to walk among the Yoruba people. He was sent to walk in a town called Uruago. His name is Guy Playfair, and that's him in the in the picture, that was, that's the picture of his first house in Urago. He arrived in 1911. He was moved to Urago to start a new work among a people group that had never had the gospel. Guy Playfair started the work and a few others joined him a few years later. Let's go for the next one. About a year after Guy Playfair arrived and started the work, Two women were sent to work with him. One of them was Catherine, and the other one was Helen. And within a year, Helen was beaten by a viper and died in Urago, and that's the grave of Helen. The gospel has cost many. The fact that others need to hear this good news has been costly for the church. But remember, it cost God his only begotten son. But these people never gave up. The cost never pushed them to give up. Guy Playfair, Catherine, and others continue to share the good news with people in my area. Next slide. Through the ministry of Guy Playfair, Catherine, and others, the church was planted in Urago, but it didn't stop in that town. They wanted to take the gospel to the other villages around Urago area. And a number of those pictures where the, the, the person on top is the, one of the very first converts in Urago who became a helper to Guy Playfair to take the gospel to the other villages around. Let's go for the next one. Guy Playfair and Brahima, as that man was called, started trekking into the interior of Nigeria. This is the, the, the picture here is the route that the, the early missionaries took to the, to the place where they established the very first station. And my town is southwest of that line that you're seeing. Okay, the next one. Now, this is the, the route that Guy Playfair walked from Urago to my own village. And it was in 1913 that Guy Playfair and Brahima walked into my village to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to my people. It was a very small village. It was a village that was steeped in occultism and the worship of idols. It was a village that mixed Islam with idol worship. It was a syncretic Islam that was practiced, practiced by the people of my village. 
but they were very committed in what they do. In fact, it is recorded in the archives, of the Nigerian archives, that my village was the head, the, the, the uh, chief city of the worship of the Ogun deity, which is the Yoruba people's god of iron or god of war. My town was the center of its worship. So these were not people who are looking for another religion. They were people who are committed to what they were doing, and into that situation walked Guy Playfair and Brahima sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. God was faithful. The gospel bore fruit, but persecution quickly arose, and the Christians were severely persecuted because these people did not want Christianity to the point that the village split into two and the Christians have had to move and establish a different village for themselves. So families were split into two. My own family was split. My dad was among those who rejected the faith and my uncle who was his elder brother, was among those who believed and moved away and started a whole new village. That's how serious the issue was between that within our village. But God never gave up. He never gave up on my village. The next slide. These were just examples of what my people were worshipping. I grew up to find my parents worshipping things like that. I grew up watching my parents make sacrifice to things like that. But God never gave up. Because Jesus was still seeking and saving those who are lost. It's interesting, it's those who are lost that he was seeking. And my family was still lost. My parents were still lost. He never gave up on them. Next slide. This was the church, the very site of this church. So that's the name Owa Kajola. My town, my village used to call Owa. Now we have Owa Kajola, which is the town that was established by those who came to the Christian faith and who were literally pushed out of the village, who were run out of town. They established this new village called Owakajola. And that very site where that church is was the very site where Guy Playfair, the SI missionary from, uh, from the, uh, Canada, that's the very site he knelt down to pray for those believers and for God's work to continue among them. The church is still there today, the very site where he prayed. Like I said, God never gave up. The next slide. God brought the, a few years after those people moved, the rest of the village also moved. They moved to a new site. So we, we, they were just like three miles apart before they are now about five miles apart. They established a new village where the gospel was not present. But like I said, because God never gave up on anyone, God pursued them to that village as well. One of the people in that village, through the encounter with the believers and the missionaries, came to faith in Jesus and started again sharing the gospel in the new village, the village that had decided they didn't want to be believers. I grew up to know the man, the very first believer in this village. And that's how the church was established again. And that was how my own family, my parents, came to faith in Jesus. Well, they came to start attending church, basically. They, 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 became, they came from being syncretic uh, uh, Muslims to syncretic Christians because they moved from folk Islam to folk Christianity. They were going to church, but they were still worshiping idols. They were still unsure of their faith. And that was the context into which I was born. And growing up, I went to church, but I would watch my parents come back from church and worship mute idols. I watched my parents 
you know, live in fear of spirits. I watched my parents live out what the power of darkness could do in a life that does not know Jesus. You see, in this part of the world, the gospel, ha the gospel has been present for so long. And I think sometimes we actually forget what it means to live in darkness because we have experienced the light for so long. When the Bible talked about those who are in darkness and under the dominion of Satan, it is true. And darkness is real. And I watched my own parents experience what it means to live in darkness until the light of life dawned on their hearts. But I praise God that they both came to know Jesus before they passed away. And I look forward to seeing them one day in glory. It was in that context that I grew up the first love I had was for the Word of God. I loved the Bible. So I got my first Bible together with my brother. We walked and got our first Bible when I was 11. And then we walked for another two years to get a second one when I was 13. We loved to read the Bible. And it was in reading the Bible that I came to understand, I watched that what my parents were doing were not probably the right thing which one was the right thing? Well, SIM didn't just preach the gospel and plant churches. SIM also established schools. And I went to an SIM high school. I was taught by SIM missionaries, again, from Canada and from the US and other places. And it was in the high, in high school, in my second year of high school, I was 18, that I fully understood the gospel for the first time. I had been reading the Bible. I had been hearing the, the stories of Scripture. And one day, I was in the, in the Christian group. I, uh, we have this fellowship on the evenings, like Wednesday evenings and Sunday evenings, and I was there on that Wednesday evening. And somebody shared his testimony, and he shared about his relationship with God. He was there to teach. It was just during an internship. But his younger brother was my classmate, and he shared about how God protected him and his brother. And he talked about God as if he knew God personally, as if he had a relationship with God. And it was so clear that this person was talking about a God that answered prayer, a God that he knew personally. And I realized that I didn't know that kind of a God. I didn't have the relationship that this man had with God. And in that meeting, the Lord convicted my heart. It was my sin that was separating me from him. I came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. that I was a sinner. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. I was lost. And from that meeting, I went to my hostel went to my room, I was in body house, got on my knees, and with tears of gratitude for what Jesus had done for me, I offered my life to him. I asked him to come into my heart and to come into my life, and I prayed that day, and I said to Jesus, Lord, you have done so much for me. I don't want you to just save my life. I want you to take my life and use it as you please. If you have done all of this just for me, you deserve the rest of my life. That was a prayer of gratitude. I didn't pray that prayer out of obligation. I prayed it out of gratitude for him who came to seek and to save me, who died on the cross just so that I can have a relationship with God. So that was, that's my story. And that's how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. It was exactly a hundred years since Guy Playfair stepped into my village 
And exactly 120 years when those three young men arrived in Nigeria that I was appointed SIM International Director. And I've asked myself, who could ever have written a story like that? Only God. Only God could write a story like that. Only God could call a village boy, a bush boy, from a tiny village. Look at that. That is my, my village. That's where I come from. That's how little it is. That's how tiny it is. But God never gave up on that little place. How can we give up on those who have never heard? If Jesus never gave up on that place. So, that's where we are today. SIM is committed to communities where Christ is least known. SIM is committed to the places in the world where the gospel is yet to penetrate. We ask the same question as you are asking, how will they hear? How will they hear about him who had come to seek and to save them? Unless someone will go to them. I'll be sharing more about that in the this, in this services. But I want to briefly update you. What is then happening in Africa? What's God doing beyond the simple story of a simple village boy like me? Let's see the next slide. That's a picture of my family. My whole family is a home of believers today. Everyone in my family are believers. This is more than my, there's just a few of us that got together to take a picture. I have an extended family of believers. Next slide. And while as SIM was inviting me to the, my role as the international director, the Evangelical Fellowship of Nigeria invited my younger brother as their general secretary. So from that little village, God was calling two of us into his service. How can that happen? How could that be except for the good news of Jesus Christ? The life transforming power of the gospel. Let, next slide. These are some of the, just a couple of pictures. I will run through these ones because of time. This is a picture of my school, where I went to school, the school that SIM established. These are my, the, one, the middle one on the top is my classmates. The picture that we took, I mean my uh, fellowship group, some of the picture we took when I was in high school. The others are some of other classes. Let's go to the next one. This is one of my teachers, actually Miss Webb, was the person who discipled me when I gave my life to Christ. That was my Bible teacher and one of my favorite teacher. In fact, the favorite teacher of many, many of my classmates. Uh, today, we have a WhatsApp group and we talk about our class and our, our, our teachers and the teacher that is mentioned the most is Miss Webb. She's, she's going to be with the Lord today, but she invested many, many years of her life in people like me. Next one, please. These are some of my classmates. They've gone on to do amazing things for the Lord. From my own class, there are at least five of us in full-time Christian work today from my own class, shaped in those schools as people invested their lives in ours. Next one. This is just another group. In about three years ago, some of my set, those people in my set got together and they said, we want to say thank you to our teachers. So they got together and then they invited all our teachers that they could reach to say thank you to them for investing in their life. After more than 30 years, they brought those teachers together because of the impact of life on life discipleship. In a little school, that was established by missionaries, people who had come so that we could hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The next one. This is more of the, my classmates, just a, a number of them equipped 
are cut out equipped to face the future. Many of them will say to you, it is what they received in that school that has shaped their lives up to now. Next one. And these are a number of some of the pictures of our teachers in the school, a number of the missionaries that were our teachers and principals and so on of the school. Go to the next one. Well, I went on to medicine and again, that's the Lord calling me. When I, when I got to the point where I had to go to university, I had to pray for the Lord's guidance and I don't have time to tell you the whole story tonight, but uh, because I had told Jesus the day I gave my life to him that I want him to take my life and use it as he pleased, I felt like at every point I had to ask the Lord for direction in my life because of course he owns me now. And I prayed asking the Lord for direction. It was a very clear guidance of the Lord to medical school. I didn't want to be a doctor. I wanted to be an engineer, have a nice office, air conditioned office, big cars, and just, you know, enjoy life, you see. But then the Lord sent me to medical school. I will share more of that as the weekend goes on. But when I finished medical school, where did I go to get, do my residency? another SIM established hospital. So I went to an SIM established high school. I went to do my training in an SIM established hospital. That's where I did my residency in family medicine and then get further training in surgery as well. And these were some of the people that God used in that process. Next one. And then in 1993, the church in Nigeria decided that it's time that they participate in global mission when SIM celebrated its centennial in 1993, that's 100 years, our church celebrated with SIM the, the, that they brought the gospel to us. And the church said, it's time that we also participate in global mission. And our church dedicated three couples to, as the start of the church's commitment to global mission uh, Joanna and I were among the three couples. Actually, we were, we were the one on your right in that picture. A little younger then. Um, that was the beginning of another journey for us. God called us to Niger to serve there to join the SIM team at Gaomi Hospital, which you already heard about uh, from Steve. Let's see the next picture. This is Gaomi. Uh, this is where we served. God, we felt God was calling us to serve the Muslim world. Our heart uh, cries out for the Muslim, for all people who don't know Jesus, but we feel particularly called to reach out to the Muslims. And we went to Gaomi to serve among the Muslim people of Niger Republic. Uh, and then the rest of the story you've had already. Let's go on. We are not the only one that God has called. Since then, God has called many others, and I can't read out all the names to you, but every one of those names you see up there, I think I have about 10 or 12 there, every one of those people got their training at Evangel Hospital Joss and went out to serve Jesus somewhere else. The impact of godly investment in the life of young people is difficult to quantify. Sometimes we, we might be anxious to see the result of our money and our investment in our missionaries. Believe me, brothers and sisters, those results don't come until years later. This, many of these people, through the interaction with missionaries, surgeons, and physicians who invested in their training, they also caught the vision for mission. And each one of those people went to somewhere in Africa or beyond Africa to serve Jesus as missionaries. When I finished, I looked back and I realized that about 86% of those of us who trained up to my set had gone out to serve Jesus somewhere. 86% from a residency program. I don't know any other hospital that has re replicated that. That's the impact of the gospel. Let's go on. So, I want to conclude by asking, what if we take our Lord Jesus seriously? 
when he said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. What if we actually take that very seriously and we begin to ask ourselves, where are those who are lost? Where are those who are lost, whom he has come to seek and to save? Let's see the next slide. The, the churches in Africa are committed to taking the gospel to new places. We have challenges. I'm going to summarize some of those challenges for you. One of the biggest challenges of the church in Africa today is its growth. Because the church is actually growing pretty rapidly in Africa. But the, when the church is growing rapidly, what suffers is discipleship. What suffers is the intentional investment in the people so that they become mature in the faith, so that they grow in Christ-likeness. I see that everywhere in the world, actually, that discipleship has become neglected in the church. Now, the result of that is the impact and the penetration of what we, we now commonly call the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is different to Pentecostalism. There's Pentecostalism and there, is, there are different streams of Pentecostalism, but actually the people who push the, the, the prosperity gospel the most in Africa are more indigenous African churches, that churches that have been planted by Africans that embrace the Pentecostal stream, but in addition, actually then embrace a prosperity gospel. It's much more than prosperity gospel. I call it an African traditional religion with, a, with Christian spirituality on top of it. Because a lot of times, what they are teaching is simple African traditional religion, but in a garb of Christianity. Where you have the, the big man who is the man of God, who is the one that can pray for everybody and no one else, you know, has, you know, God doesn't listen to anyone except that person. Of course, that's what my parents believed. That's why they went to, to the, to the chama. That's when they, they take their, their chicken to the, the witch doctor to make sacrifice for them because he was the only one the gods will listen to. And then, you know, you see the use of all kinds of things today, like holy water and holy handkerchief and holy all kinds of things. That's just replaced the old chama that they used to weave and, and you put around your wrist or you put on your finger or you put around your waist. It's just exactly the same thing in a new language. That is one of the greatest challenge of the church in Africa, is that we have now leaders who are taking the church back into African traditional religion rather than the faith of Jesus Christ. That's one of our biggest challenges. Of course, the church also faced the challenge of Islam. There is a concerted effort to Islamize Africa. Whether you believe it or not, it's going on. And all the violence is part of that process of trying to Islamize Africa. But I tell you, one of the reasons there's so much violence, it's also because the gospel has borne fruit. Because the gospel has borne fruit, because the church of Jesus Christ had penetrated places that used to be the preserve of the Muslims. And today, there's a reaction to that all across Africa, and especially in places like northern Nigeria and Nigeria and so on. So the church is facing the challenge from Islam and is facing the challenge from within itself. And there are many other challenges. The church in Africa is being pressured to compromise its teaching and its theology. But even then, God is doing amazing things through the African churches. And let me tell you, some of the stories to wrap up. One of the things we see happening in Africa today is the rise of the African missionaries, the church sending missionaries to other parts of the world. I told you about the commissioning of Joanna and I. We are just the tip of the iceberg. 
God is now calling many from Africa to take the gospel to places where people live and die without the good news of Jesus Christ. I was just in, we, Joanna and I were just in Mali. Mali has suffered tremendously from the attack of the, of the Al-Qaeda in, in the Maghreb. You have heard of the attacks in Bamako and other parts of Mali. Well, when we arrived in Mali, when you go into a restaurant in Mali right now, you have to be searched and you have a guard, an armed guard by the door because of the, the, the activities of terrorists. But at the same time, we welcome three new couples from Ethiopia who are just going to start their ministry in Mali. They are coming in spite of what was going on in Mali. God is calling many to participate in the gospel. Now, we believe that God, it will take collaborative relationship between the North and the South, between Africa and the West, and Africa and others to accomplish that goal. The church in Africa alone is not going to reach the world. The church in America alone is not going to reach the world. SIM alone will never reach the world. It is the collaborative activity of the people of God in response to the call of Jesus Christ so that they may hear it is that collaborative effort that we bring the gospel to communities where currently Jesus is not known. Just recently, in a recent board meeting, our board approved a new initiative where we will put teams together and intentionally all around the world put teams of believers, of workers, in places that we can identify with no gospel witness. And guess where they want us to put one of the first ones? Mali. Our team in Mali said, we are ready. The door is open. This place is open to the gospel now. And believe me, it is. These guys are doing amazing things. There are just very few of them. They're telling me all the churches they've planted and all of that. And it's like, what is going on? I had the same story from Liberia with a team in Liberia going to the, the, the church, going to the border with Burkina and Muslim, Muslim villages inviting them to come and start churches. And I said, what is really going on? Because Jesus is still Lord of all the earth. Because the Holy Spirit is still touching lives. But they need to hear. A Muslim will not just come to faith. They have to hear the good news. And how will they hear? Unless together we still say Jesus is still seeking, to seek, uh, is still seeking and saving those who are lost. I was one of those who were lost. My village was among the unreached people. My family was one of the unreached families. And God sent those three young men from Canada and the US to open the door, and then a champion athlete from Canada. And for that reason today, I can stand before you from a little tiny village. Think of what God can do with those of us who are here tonight. If we join hands and we say, we will make sure they're here. Whatever it takes, their eternity is our responsibility. We will join hands to make sure they're here because Jesus is still seeking and saving that which was lost. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your redemption. Thank you for saving someone like me, totally unworthy. Lord, I didn't come from a popular family. Nobody even knows my family, my name, my family name, my village didn't even exist in the map for many years, on, on the map for many years, Lord. And yet, because you were seeking and saving that which was lost, you saved me. And you are asking us in this church, how will the rest here? 
there are still thousands and thousands, millions and millions, about 3.7 million, who still haven't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are asking one another to, this weekend and tonight, how will they hear? You are still God. So unite our hearts so that together we might say, they will hear because we will respond to our Lord's heart. Thank you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. missionaries to teach us but now we're asking to to learn from Africa we want Africa to teach us and uh, to hear the message from those who've received the message it's a beautiful picture the verse that came to my mind tonight uh, was in 2nd Peter it says the Lord is not slow concerning his promise as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Don't give up praying for those people around you that seem far from the gospel. Joshua and his family are a reminder in a hundred years of the work of SIM to the interior, are a reminder that God is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, and that he will break in. So don't give up hope. One other thing I want to mention to you. We're very thankful that God has sent Andy Lee to us. And from this point forward, he's taking over as the mission's responsibilities. So I'm no longer the mission's pastor after tonight. And uh, Andy will, has been growing in that responsibility and will be taking over all our missions effort. We are so privileged that God sent Andy and Ollie to us. Someone with amazing experience, deep heart for God, <clears throat> gifts, and passion for the gospel. He's lived in the Middle East. He's lived in Singapore. He's lived in uh, Indonesia. And God has sent him here to help us equip this body to continue to be a sending church. I'm thankful, Andy, that God has sent you here and look forward to being under your leadership uh, in terms of the mission of First Presbyterian Church. You're dismissed. Yes. Yes, you are going to. You're dismissed and come join us for some refreshments.